Well, we're in a series um, on the life of faith. Brett had a great message last week on keeping our passion alive, but I want to go back to talking about faith. I just feel like it's something God's put on our heart. Uh, he wants to see it into the congregation. And I'm going to review some of the thoughts that I shared a couple of weeks ago. It's not because I don't have enough material or information to share. It's just that we don't get it the first time. Faith doesn't come by having heard. It comes by hearing and hearing and continuing to hear. And uh, at some point, the light goes on and revelation happens. And it moves that 18 inches from our head to our hearts where uh, things begin to really happen. So let me just review some of the key thoughts that I shared last week. Number one, God has called us to live a life of faith. He, he really has. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith and not by sight. Would you just uh, say that verse with me? For we live by faith and not by sight. You know, it doesn't mean that God wants us to put a blindfold over our eyes, walk around with a white cane, stumbling into walls. No, it just means that our focus ought to be God and His kingdom and some spiritual things that are realities in the spiritual realm that we cannot see with our physical eyes. We walk by faith and not by sight. A couple other verses. 2 Corinthians 4.18, so we fix our eyes not, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And then in Hebrews 12, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So there's lots of other scriptures we could look at, but basically we can see that living by faith is normal Christian life. It's not optional. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are an intellectual you're a science guy, I like to see it proven in the test tube. Um, I'm an analytical guy, I gotta just work it all out in my mind. That's all great. None of that matters when it comes to living by faith. It's just not an option. God has enrolled every single believer in the school of faith, and there's some lessons about faith that you and I just have to learn. It's just part of what he's called us to do. Tell your neighbor, you're in the school of faith whether you like it or not. <laughs> and, and I realize that living by faith runs contrary to the, uh, the way a lot of the world thinks, really. I, uh, I read that the American Atheist Organization paid $20,000 for a billboard in New Jersey, and it had a picture, it was near Christmas time, it had a picture of three wise men who were approaching nativity, and the word said, you know it's a myth, this season celebrate reason. This season celebrate reason. Well, the world celebrates reason and logic and everything that they can test and attest to. Now, I'm not saying throw your mind out. God's given us a mind. We need to use it. We need to develop it. But the world basically disregards faith as something for the weak or, uh, you know, something that's meaningless, something for weak-minded people. How many know God's a God of faith? I don't think he's a weak-minded person, right? And he has called us to live really at a higher level. Faith is the highest level of, learn of living, I believe. Live by faith, not by sight. You know, we, we once had, a, many years ago, we had an evangelist came through named Norman Robertson. I don't know if you, any of you remember him. But uh, he would preach messages, and then he would call people forward in an altar call and just go down the line praying for whatever they needed. And I thought it was interesting, every once in a while, it seemed like about every ninth, tenth person, maybe it was more, uh, he, he would just pause and say, Lord, give them a head bypass. Give them a head bypass. What he was praying was, what he was discerning, that they were living more out of their mind, out of their intellect, out of their reason, rather than out of their heart, out of faith. And it was limiting what God wanted to do in their life. And so he said, Lord, give them a head bypass. Anybody here need a head bypass? <laughs> Here's another scripture, Galatians 2.20. says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That, that old man, that old nature, that, that, old, that old person that was uh, determined to just live by, by the five senses and, and live by my intellect, 
And certainly that old nature, that sinful nature, all that's gone. Uh, it's been crucified with Christ. Then he goes on to say, in the life which I now live, listen to this, I live by faith in the Son of God. We walk by faith and not by sight. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I mean, it's scripture after scripture. God's trying to get the point across. Hey, folks, this is a faith walk. This is a faith life. And we got to engage our faith. We got to understand what faith is. We got to understand how to use our faith, how to develop our faith, how to increase our faith. And all those things are possible. You know, your life as a, as a born-again Christian is simply marked by faith. You're saved by faith. You fight the good fight of faith. Uh, you overcome the world by faith. The Bible says that you can move mountain-like problems by faith. We please God by faith. On and on it goes. Everything has to do with faith. In fact, the Bible says without faith, you know, if it's not a faith, it's a sin. So if we get out of faith, when we're, we're, walking in, we're walking in sin. And so here's the second point, just to review. God has given us a measure of faith. I like that. God, God never calls you to do something that he doesn't equip you to do. God, God never, he, he, you know, God calls us to love one another, but he would never ask us to do that if he didn't give us enough love to get the job done. And in Romans chapter 5, he said he poured out his love into our heart. Everything that we need to love one another, God's already given it to us. He wouldn't ask us to forgive if he didn't give us the grace to forgive. I don't care how hurt you are. I don't care how offended you are. I'm going to tell you there is a grace that's greater than your offense. There is a grace that's greater than the hurt in your heart. There's an, grace is an empowering. There's an empowering to forgive that person, to let that offense go and let Jesus come and heal your heart. God never calls us to do anything that he doesn't equip us to do. And it's the same with faith. If God's called us to live a life of faith, then what has he done to equip us? Well, let me give you this verse. Romans 12, verse 3 says this, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think of himself soberly, listen to this, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. To me, that is one of the most exciting verses in the Bible. And you're looking at me like a cow at a new gate. What's he talking about? That doesn't move me. It should. God has dealt you a measure of his kind of faith. <laughs> what kind of faith does God have? He's given us a measure of faith. What kind of faith does he have? He's got the kind of faith that created the worlds and the planets and the solar system, the universe that we live in just by simply speaking a word. He created it out of nothing. You know, we, we say, you know, a person was so creative, they make a potter, you know, make a, uh, you know, a pot or something out, out of clay. And we say, that guy is so creative. He created that pot. No, he didn't. He made that pot, but there was, some, there was a substance there that he made it out of, the clay. God, when he created, made something out of nothing. There was zero there. And God had an image in his mind of light, and he said, let there be light and light came out of nothing. That's faith. That's how faith works. That's the power of faith. Romans 4.17 says that God is a God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. God calls into being that which does not exist. You know, it doesn't matter if something is dead or alive it doesn't, to God. It doesn't matter if something exists or doesn't exist because when God speaks, whatever is dead can come alive. Whatever does not exist will suddenly exist. That's faith. That's God. And you might be thinking, well, that is God, and I'm not God. And he's got that kind of power, but I don't. But listen, he gave you a measure. We just read it. He gave you a measure of his kind of faith to operate the same way that he operates. Are you getting a little bit more excited now? <laughs> 
Jesus taught about this in Mark eleven twenty three. This is a powerful principle on faith. He said, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. And I know we read verses like that and our eyes roll back in our head and, or glaze over and we think, that just cannot be true. That, that just can't be true. I don't know what Jesus is trying to say there, but he certainly couldn't be telling me that if I believe something in my heart and I speak it out in my mouth, even if I'm speaking to a mountain to be removed, that it will be done. But I want to tell you, that's exactly what he meant. How many know Jesus said what he meant and he meant what he said? And when he said, if you got faith in your heart and you have corresponding words that align with that faith in your heart and you speak that out, even mountains can move. Now, God's not interested in us moving physical mountains. How many know that? But wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, think about, picture yourself standing at the base of Mount Hood and you say, Mount Hood, in the name of Jesus, be cast into the sea. And that mountain begins to shake and begin to rumble. And all of a sudden, it begins to lift off like a rocket lifting off the pad at launch time and slowly begins to raise up and and, uh, gains more speed as it goes. And all of a sudden, boom, it's cast into the sea and it's gone. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Just think of the um, um, incredible authority and power that God's given us And it all operates by faith. Like I said, God's not interested in us moving uh, physical mountains. But there are some mountain-sized problems that sometimes come in our lives that God says, you need to use your faith to get that out of the way. And we we go to God whining and complaining about the mountain. He says, I've given you a measure of my kind of faith to speak to the mountain and command it to go. You still out there? Pause and think about that. Selah. What kind of mountains are in your life? There's mountains of sickness and disease. There's mountains of poverty. There's mountains of emotional pain and trauma. There's mountains of chemical addiction, and we could go on on, on and on. And what do we do about those? So many times people just roll over and say, well, whatever it will be, will be. I guess these are the, the cards that I've been dealt, and I just have to live with it. Well, you can if you want to. But God has given you a measure of his kind of faith to get rid of the mountains. Tell your neighbor, I've got a measure of mountain moving faith. Go ahead and tell them. How much faith did God give you? He said he gave you a measure of faith. How much is that? I don't know. But I know this, it's at least a starter package of faith. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I... Uh, I've had the same razor for like 40 years, <laughs> a Gillette Track 2. I don't even think they make those anymore. I mean, I'm talking, I've had, I think I got this right out of high school, and, and I've had it all this time. And, but I, I broke the handle a couple weeks ago, and I, I thought about gluing it back together, and I thought, oh, come on, just go out and buy a new one. And so I went out, and they, they got some really fancy ones. They got ones with like six, seven blades, but I took the next step up. I got the Mach 3. The Gillette Mach 3. I don't know where they get these names, like out of Star Trek or something. Mach 3. But it's got three blades instead of two. How am I looking today? I'm looking pretty good. But the package said it was a starter package. And it gave me the handle and three blades to get going on it. It was enough to kind of get going. I don't know how much faith God has given each one of us. I think it's all the same measure, but it's a starter package anyway. It's enough to get you going in this thing called faith, this life of faith. And and what you do with that starter package is completely up to you. 
You can increase your faith. You can strengthen your faith by feeding on the, on the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Every time you open this and read it and meditate it and think on it and ponder it and pray it, you are building faith on the inside. Every time you use your faith, when you pray, when you make a faith confession and a declaration, you're, you're using your faith. Every time you have a headache and instead of running to the cabinet to get some Advil or whatever, the first thing you do is you pray. The first thing you do is lay hands on your head and you command that headache to go in Jesus' name. Now, if you need to use the, the Advil or the ibuprofen or whatever, that's fine, but you have started to exercise your faith. And you've got to start somewhere. Don't wait till you got stage four cancer to start exercising your faith. Start with the headaches. Start with the little things. Start with a hundred dollar bill, a hundred dollar payment that you need, rather than wait till you, you know, got a fifty thousand dollar payment. You start talking to God about it, and you just don't have the faith to handle that. You know, Jesus actually talked about three levels of faith. He talked about no faith, little faith and great faith. And you can be anywhere in that spectrum. Now, if you're a believer, you you can't have no faith. You got to have at least a little faith because you can't be saved without faith. You're saved by grace through faith. But once when Jesus and his disciples were in a boat, you know the story, a great storm arose and Jesus was so tired from ministry that he was asleep on a cushion and the storm got so bad and the wind, wind and waves were crashing against the boat and the disciples started to panic and they went and you know, woke Jesus up and said, Jesus, don't you care that we're about to die? We're about to perish. And he gets up and uh, th- this, is what, this is what he says. He says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? That's where they were in their faith. No faith. No faith, folks. Faithless. And that's why they were full of fear. You can't be full of faith and full of fear at the same time. If you're full of fear, it means there's not a whole lot of faith hanging around. It's the way it is. Then on another occasion, Jesus' disciples were in a boat, and uh, Jesus had been praying over on the mountain, and he walked on water and met them out in the middle of the lake and uh, kind of freaked them out at first. And Peter wasn't quite sure about if that was Jesus or not. He said, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come on. (laughs) You know, if you got the faith, go ahead and do it. Step out of the boat. And uh, he did. He stepped out of the boat. We got to give him credit for that. And he walked on water for a little while. We don't know how long until his eyes, he took his eyes off Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. He took his eyes off of Jesus, put him on the storm, on the circumstances, on the problem. And immediately he began to sink. What did Jesus say? Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So we had no faith in one instance. Here, we have little faith. That's an improvement. Hallelujah, they're growing their faith. And then on another occasion, a woman came to Jesus seeking healing for her daughter. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, it says, A Canaanite woman came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out to us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So the woman came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. And he replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Listen to what Jesus, how he responded. He said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and her daughter was healed from that moment. She had great faith. So you can have no faith, little faith, or great faith. And it's up to you how much we develop and increase it. Here's the third point. This measure of faith, I believe, is one of the greatest gifts that God could ever give us outside of His Son and outside of the Holy Spirit. This measure of God kind of faith, Romans 12, 3, that He's given a measure of, we have this, is one of the greatest gifts that he could ever give us. Why? Because I believe that it's through faith that everything that we need in this life comes to us through faith. 
through the measure of faith that he gave us. God has given us a capacity to operate like he operates. Not on the same level, of course. We're humans. But how many know Jesus operated as a human, filled with the Holy Spirit? The Bible says he did, divested himself of his divine attributes, and he operated. He, did, he absolutely did no miracles until he was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And from that time on, he says, it's the Father in me that does the work. And so that's how you and I get the job done. That's how you and I uh, see answers to prayer and see healings and miracles. It's through the, the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And faith is what activates the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Now, I shared this scripture. This is the third message in a row that I've shared this next scripture. And I'm trusting that it's beginning to register on the inside. Ephesians 1.3 you might want to look this up on your phone. Highlight it. Underline it. Look it up in your Bible. Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Would you notice the tense in that verse? How many grammar students do we have? He will. Is that what it said? He will bless us. He might bless us. We're on good behavior. We'll get a few blessings. No, he said, he has blessed us. It's in the past tense. In the mind of God, every spiritual blessing has already been provided to you. I, I, I hope you get this. In the mind of God, in the heart of God, every spiritual blessing, everything that you will ever need on planet earth to be victorious, to be successful as a Christian, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, to receive fi uh, financial blessings, physical blessings, in the mind of God, it's already been done. And here really is where so many people struggle with faith. It's the tenses. This is, how, this is where so many good, sincere, God-loving Christians struggle with this idea of faith. They, they just don't get the tenses right. As long as God's blessings and provision are in the future, in our mind, we will not access them. Can I say that again? As long as God's blessings and His provision... Whatever that is, healing, financial, whatever it is, are, is in the future in your mind, you cannot access them because in the mind of Christ, they're in the past. It's past tense in God's mind. It's already done. But if it's in the future for you, you can't access that because they're not in the future. Is this making sense? I tell you, I struggle with this message. There was, God's wanting to communicate some things and I hope he can get it through my pea-sized brain this morning. Uh, he, he's got, <laughs> this is what he's got to work with, and I'm, I'm doing my best, but I know he's trying to get a message across to us. People will say this all the time. I hear them all the time. Maybe they need healing. I believe God will heal me. I believe God will bless me. It's always in the future. Someday in the future, it could be an hour from now, a, a, a day from now, a week from now, it doesn't matter what the time is, but... The point is, in their mind, that blessing, that provision is in the future somewhere. Rather than saying, I believe God has blessed me, and I'm ready to receive it now. Hope is always in the future. Faith is now. Faith is present tense. It's done. It's been provided, whatever I need. God has blessed it. me in the heavenly realms already. It's there. And all I need to do is use my faith to release that into my present circumstances. Let, let me just give you divine healing for an example. You know, as long as you've got healing in the future, you cannot access it because healing is in the past, in the mind of God. Let me share you three verses to prove this to you. First, Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. It says, however, speaking of Jesus, it was our sickness that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. 
and by his wounds we are healed. Now this is Isaiah the prophet who was prophesying uh, of a future event. He was prophesying several hundred years before Jesus came on the scene about Jesus the Messiah coming and the ministry that he would have of bearing our sicknesses, carrying our pain on the cross, and by his wounds, those 39 stripes that he took, by those wounds, we are healed. That was the tense, we are healed. Now, this scripture was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Jesus himself declared that in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 through 17. Now, I know some of this, man, it, just, it may go over your head or it may not, I don't know, but this is so important. This, this, for some folks, getting a hold of this it might mean life and death. If you've got a terminal disease and the doctors can do nothing about it, what are your choices? It's either faith, it's either divine healing, or you go to meet Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that, but it may be before your time. So Matthew 8, verse 16 says, Now when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and listen, and he healed all who were sick. This happened so that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled. He himself took our illnesses and carried away our diseases. So Matthew himself declares, looking back, at Isaiah the prophet and what he prophesied, he said, this is fulfilled right now in the life of Jesus. I'm seeing this prophetic word uh, come to life right now, right before my eyes, in the life and the ministry of Jesus. And then Peter, the apostle Peter, several years after Jesus was crucified and ascended, went back to heaven, he writes this in 1 Peter 2.24, he actually quotes the verse out of Isaiah, he said, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Listen to this. And by his wounds you have been healed. Notice the tense. What's the tense? Past tense. You have been. So Peter, looking back at the cross, looking back at what Jesus did at Calvary, said, by his wounds, you have been healed. It's already done in the mind of God. Your healing has been secured. Your healing has been provided in the mind of God. Please don't put it in the future. Don't ask God to do something in the future that he's already done in the past. Your starting point for receiving divine healing is getting that revelation, getting that understanding that in the mind of God, it's already done. By his stripes, I have been healed. I was thinking about my mom back in uh, 1976. She had cancer pretty bad and uh, probably would have died if it were not for the, you know, the miracle of God in that situation. But, you know, at that point in her journey, she really didn't know a lot about the faith message that we're talking about today. And so in her mind, it was hope. I hope God heals me in the future sometime. I'm going to pray that God heals me. And uh, she would be talking to my dad and said, you know, I believe that God is going to heal me in the future. And my dad would respond this way, believe that and die. Seems a little harsh. But he was trying to shock her. He had a little bit of revelation that she didn't have at that point. He was trying to shock her into the understanding, if you keep healing in the future, you cannot access it there because that's not where it is. It's in the past. And that's the starting point. So how do we access it? By, by our faith. We, you know, praise and thanksgiving is the language of faith. And I believe the first thing that we need to do is, Lord, thank you that by your stripes I was healed. By your stripes this heart problem was healed, you took it upon yourself. By your stripes this arthritis, you took that upon yourself, and those stripes that you bore secured my heat. 2,000 years ago in Pilate's courthouse, you secured my healing for whatever infirmity that I'm dealing with. That's just an example of divine healing. It works that way with anything that you need, finances, uh, healing of your soul, well, whatever it might be, uh, we, we got to realize that in the mind of God, it's already been done. You know, if I deposited 
$100 in your bank account, and I told you about it, uh, it would be foolish to say, well, Pastor David, um, I believe Pastor David will deposit $100 in my bank account and go around telling everybody that when I've already done it. Wouldn't that be foolish? I've, I, I, I've just told you I've deposited $100. It's past tense. It's already there. It's waiting for you to access it. But if you go around telling people, well, I believe that some, at some point Pastor David is going to deposit $100 in my bank account, that would be absolutely foolish. I mean, you would never be able to use it if it's in the future, in your mind. But if it's already there and you know it and you believe it, then you can put a demand on, that, on your account for $100. Faith is putting a demand on the account that God has created with your name on it. Did you get that? Faith is putting a demand on the account that God has created with your name on it. You got an account in heaven with your name on it. God has blessed you in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You have an account. If it's healing you need, it's in your account. If it's finances you need, it's in your account. If, if you need a right mind, you need a sound mind, you're struggling with your brain, it's in your account. Don't ask God to do it in the future when he's already done it in the past. Faith puts a demand on what's already there. When you go to Fred Meyer and you buy some groceries and you stick your debit card in that little machine, you're putting a demand on your account. And if there's no money there, it'll reject it. You won't be able to buy anything. But if there's money in there, if there's a balance, then it will be approved. You have just put a demand on your account. You can't buy something with money you don't have. There has to be money in there. Well, thank God he's already made a deposit in your account with every spiritual blessing, everything that you need. I know I'm repeating myself. I'm doing it on purpose. Until you quit looking at me like a cow in a new gate, I'm going to keep talking about it. Do you understand that you can make a demand on your heavenly accounts? And we're not demanding anything of Jesus. Well, Jesus, I demand. No, he's already deposited in your account. You're simply making a demand on the account by, your, by faith. It's with your faith that you do that. Faith is believing what God has said. He's already said. He's deposited in your account every spiritual blessing. Faith is putting a demand on that. It's already done. It's past tense. It's there. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11.1 1 said, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. You know, you can have assurance about things that you can't see or experience in the physical realm. You can have assurance that your healing is secured even if you still have pain and symptoms in your body. You, you can have assurance that your needs are going to be met even when you look at your bank account and all you see is zeros. How can you do that? By faith. It's believing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing the Word of God. Every time you read Philippians 4.19, which says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory, you ought to begin rejoicing and thanking God that all of your needs are met. It's all zeros in the checkbook. I don't know how God's going to do it, but all I know is God has already made a deposit. All my needs are met in the mind of God. And, and by my faith, I'm going to make a demand on what's already there. And we start by lining our words up with what God has said. So many times we sabotage our faith because we say exactly the opposite of what God has said. You know the word confess, talking about confessing our faith, means to say the, say the same thing that God says. We need to say the same thing that God says. 
If he says that we're the righteousness of Christ, don't go around telling people that you're just some kind of a sinner saved by grace. When God says that you're the righteousness of Christ and he's made you a saint. Don't go around telling people how broke you are. Because you can't, active, you, you can't access the provision that way. Your words have to line up with what God said. Jesus said, if you say, believe in your heart and say with your mouth, it will be done. I think sometimes we need to walk around with our hand over our mouth to keep from speaking things we shouldn't speak. And if that doesn't work, you know, if you're married, get your wife or your husband to help you. You know, and every time you start speaking negative words or something that's contrary to the Word of God, ask him to step on your toes or something. I don't know. (laughs) Squirt cold water in your face. Or just just acknowledge that, hey, watch your mouth. What are you saying? You know, we say the dumbest things. You know, we say things like, man, that just scared me to death. Really? You sure you want to say that? That just scared me to death. I mean, if you really understand the power of words, Proverbs said the power of life and death are in the tongue. You can have what you say. Maybe we ought to kind of watch what we're saying and get rid of some of those, you know, little phrases that we use all the time. Oh my gosh, what time is it? Well, let me just say this. God... As I said, God's given you all all the blessings in the heavenly realms, and the way you access that blessing is by faith. You know, I have have a key ring here with several keys. I got one to my car, one to the house. But I have this key here, it has an A on it, it says do not duplicate. It is a master key. This key will open every single door in this building and in the building up above, every single door. I don't know how many doors there are, 30, 40, I don't know. This, this key gives me access into whatever is, is, is that's in those rooms that I might need to get the job done. I don't have to hunt around, I knock, don't have to knock on the door, find somebody to try to open the door for me. I've got a master key that opens every single lock. I can access whatever it is in this entire building in order for me to get the job done that I need to get the job done, whatever that is. Well, faith is the master key that accesses all of God's power and provision. It's faith. Need does not move the hand of God. I said that a couple weeks ago. If need moved the hand of God, you would have no needs. He would automatically meet them. Faith is what moves the hand of God. Give me about five minutes. Let me finish this up real quick. Two weeks ago, I gave you three things that faith does. Faith sees, faith speaks, and faith acts. I want to give you one more today, and then we'll finish. Faith takes. Faith takes. First Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And I hate to break it to you, but you are in a spiritual war. Every morning when your eyes, lids open, you enter into a spiritual battle with unseen forces that are doing everything they can to rip you off of whatever God has provided for you and wants you to have. It's, it's true. A couple verses, 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Satan's number one goal is to rip you off of what God wants you to have and what he has secured for you at a great price on the cross. He wants to rip it, rip it off. And if you're going to walk in all the blessing and the provision of God, you've got to learn how to fight for those things with your faith and to hold on to them once you got them. 
The phrase, um, take hold of, says take, Scripture said, take hold of these things that God's given you. It actually means three things in the Greek. Number one, take possession of. Number two, take it by force. And number three, keep a firm grip on it. This, this is the way that God operates. He told the Old Testament Israel, listen, I'm going to give you the land. I give you the land. Here it is. However, you've got to go in and take possession of it. There's some enemies there. You've got to drive the enemies out and take possession of what I've already given. Well, if God gives it to me, why do I have to fight, fight battles? I didn't make up the rules. God did. This is just the way it works. This is how faith operates. I give it to you. You take possession of it. I think he told, was it Moses or somebody, Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot steps on will be yours. You've got to take possession of it. Take possession of it. So that's, that's one of the meanings here. Uh, another is take it by force. Jesus said uh, the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Sometimes there's got to be some force. Sometimes there's got to be some fighting. Uh, involved in this situation. Um, I don't know. I don't have time to share that. Um, well, maybe I will just, no, I won't. <laughs> I'm thinking about, it's a great illustration, great story out of my past about a fight I got into, but uh, yeah, we'll save it for another time. Here's, here's the last meaning of this, this, this phrase, take hold of. It means keep a firm grip of. Keep a firm grip of. I will tell a story on Frank Sarvabui back here. He told us this back when he was a kids pastor here many years ago, that on Black Friday one, one, one morning, he got up very, very early, and I think he went to Walmart, and I think there was an electronic device or something that he, he wanted. And so, man, he was like first in line or way up there anyway, and when they opened the doors, he got in there, and he got, there was just a few of these devices, and he got one. He had it in his hands. He started to walk out, started to walk away, up to the cash register or something, and, and this lady came up and grabbed a hold of that box and started to try to wrench it out of his hands. And he looked at her and said, lady, I should probably let him tell the story, but lady, uh, what, what are you doing? This is mine. And, and she continued to just get a hold of it, and then pretty soon she started hitting him, <laughs> trying to get that package, trying to rip that package off, and he got a hold of it. He said, lady, I got here really early this morning. This is mine. And then she just kept at it, kept at it. And finally, he just said, lady, if you want this that bad, here you go. And, uh, and gave it to her. You know, I guess that's probably the Christian thing to do in a situation like that. But when it comes to the enemy trying to rip you off and take what is rightfully yours and what God has provided for you, you better not let it go. You better get a hold of that thing. You know, we need to say, devil... This healing is mine, and I'm not going to let you rob my body of health in Jesus' name. Financial blessing and pro prosperity and provision is mine, and I'm not going to let you rip me off anymore. Peace of mind, freedom from anxiety is something that Jesus secured for me on the cross, and I'm not going to let you rip it off. We need to get a hold of the promises of God. Find out what God has promised you and provided for you. Get a hold of that thing and don't let go. I said it a couple weeks ago, be like a bulldog on a bone. I mean, don't, just don't let it go. You know, I was in, I'm almost done here. I, in high school football practice um, one year, uh, I, 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 the coach, for one reason, put me with the running backs. And I wasn't a running back. I was on the line. I was an end. And I don't know, for some reason, it's clear, go join the running backs. And so they were doing their various drills, and I wasn't familiar with them. And the very first drill they did was they, uh, they lined up all the players in that group in two lines facing each other. And then one guy was going to have the ball and run down that gauntlet, and everybody was going to try to rip that ball out of his hands. And, of course, if you watch football, you know that's what they try to do rip the ball out of your hands, and that was a drill to teach the running backs to hold on to the ball and get a grip on that thing and don't let go. Well, I didn't know what the drill was, and I happened to be the first in line. So I ran down, and I didn't hold it very, very tightly, and so, you know, somebody got a hold of the thing and ripped it out of my, rid of my hands. And the coach, I can still hear him barking at me, said, clear, 
what are you doing? Get a grip on the ball. Well, you know, I got a different coach today. His name is Jesus, but you know what? He's still telling me the same thing. Get a grip on what I provided for you and don't let it go. Don't let the enemy rip it out of your hands. And if you're thinking, man, if God gives me something, I don't have to keep a grip of it. Here's my last scripture, Revelation 3.11. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you've got. Hold on to what I've given you. Hold on to what I've provided for you. Let's stand this morning. Faith sees, faith speaks, faith acts, and faith takes. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and take a little diversion here, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know something about God, but if you were to die today, you don't have the assurance in your heart that you would go to be with Jesus. I I want you to walk out of here with that assurance. I I don't know who's all here. Everybody here might be saved, but uh, if there's somebody here, you don't have that assurance. Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. He's convicting your heart. Maybe you've known God, but you've walked away from Him. You're not really committed to Him. You don't have that strong, deep relationship. I want to pray with you this morning. Would you just raise your hand? I'll see it. I'll see that hand. Anybody else? Raise your hand if that's the Holy Spirit's talking to you this morning. This is a life of commitment. It's not a matter of, well, when I get in trouble, I know where to go to find God and cry help. This is a life of walking with Him, developing your faith, developing a relationship. If that's not where you're at, you need to get there. Raise your hand if that's, if that's you. Hallelujah. Well, one person, raise their hand. Let's pray. Just say this with me. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I put my faith in Jesus Christ to be my Savior and my Lord. Today I make a commitment to walk with Jesus every day of my life for the rest of my life. I get out of the driver's seat and I ask Jesus that you would come in, get behind the wheel, and steer my life where it needs to go. In Jesus' name, amen.